Thanks, Matthias. Um, yeah, I guess, okay, yeah, I, I'm gonna walk with this, okay. Um, so hi, um, uh, like Matias said, I'm a grad student at Berkeley. I'm also a contributor to Project Jupyter. Um, and today, um, I'm gonna be telling you about how to do these workflows in the Jupyter Notebook, um, which is something I, I sort of developed myself through my own research as I, I found I wanted a better way to make these reproducible workflows in the notebook. So um, to start out with, I'm gonna uh, just tell you um, maybe sort of an idealized analysis pipeline. So a series of components that you uh, might want to have that you want to have, you know, dependencies for, um, you know, uh, be able to link together all these different data sets um, and the analysis for them and the results, um, run them in the correct order. The example I'm going to show you is sort of more focused on my field in particular, which is computational cognitive science. Um, it's related to, to psychology. Um, but I think a lot of the components are actually the same. So while my data sets um, and the analyses that I run might be slightly different from the ones that you would run in you know, biology or physics. Um, I think the sort of the whole workflow and the components that make up the workflow are, are going to generalize to many different fields. So um, to start out with, we can say, all right, maybe we ran an experiment. Um, we asked people to like take a look at some stimuli and then give us a response about something having to do with those stimuli so we have this human data. So the first step in our analysis pipeline that we might want to do is to write a script to actually clean that data. So maybe that means parsing timestamps. Maybe we have some invalid values that we need to deal with. Um, there might be a bunch of things that we need to do to actually make this data in a state that we can do analysis on. So once we've cleaned it, then we want to actually do some analysis. So maybe in this case, we want to take an average um, response for each of the stimuli that we showed people. And maybe we also want to you know, compute some confidence intervals, something like that. Um, and then finally, once we've done this analysis, we want to actually um, plot the analysis, create a figure that will eventually end up in the paper. Um, so if this is a, you know, a modeling project, then maybe we also have some simulation data from a model. Um, and so we want to do the same thing with our simulation data. First, we need to clean it. So maybe the data is in a different format. Maybe it's in like a database somewhere, or it's in a NumPy array. And ideally, we would have it in the same type of format as our human data to make it easier to analyze the two together. So maybe we want to convert it to CSV, give it the same labels, um, et cetera. Once we've actually cleaned the data, um, then we want to uh, maybe for fit the model to the human data. Um, so maybe there's some free parameters there that we need to fit. And then once we fit it, then we would want to do a comparison between the human data and the model data, um, maybe compute some correlations, plot that comparison, plot those correlations, and then take all of these results and put them in the paper, and you have your publication. Um, I, this is an uh, idealized analysis pipeline, I said. So maybe actually even better than just copying the results to the paper, we can scratch that and say, let's automatically generate a file of our results. Um, maybe we're doing something in LaTeX, and so we can then include those results in our LaTeX file and then compile um, our LaTeX file to PDF. Um, and so this gives us a pipeline all the way, starting from our raw data, down to the final finished publication project product. So ideally, we would be able to do this whole pipeline um, with one click or one command. Um, and uh, so the question is, how do we actually do that? Okay, so the first approach that many people take, and I certainly have taken myself in the past as well, is to just write a big script um, that does all of this. You know? And this is not too bad when you have relatively um, you know, small sets of analyses that you need to do, but once you start getting maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 analyses, um, this gets very complicated, and it also, you know, you have to run everything at once. Ideally, you would want something a little bit more interactive. Um, so this is where maybe something like the Jupyter Notebook comes in, where you have this extremely interactive document. So you can have, um, you can write your code and then see the results of executing your code immediately beneath the cell. Um, you can do the same thing with plots, maybe some interactive widgets to play around with your data as you're analyzing it. You can put in documentation in the text cells to, to say what you're actually doing. Um, and so this is a much better way of doing analysis, and that's why people like the notebook, right? So maybe approach two is to have everything in one big notebook rather than one big script. Um, but this has its own drawbacks too, which is that this can get to be really unwieldy pretty quickly. So again, once you start having more and more analyses, if you have them all in one gigantic notebook, now you're not sure, like, if I change this one thing, do I need to like rerun everything below it? Or is it okay if I just change this one thing? Um, which things depend on each other? It gets hard to keep track of that. And personally, when I've done this in the past, just having a giant notebook, if I changed anything, I would generally just restart the kernel, rerun the entire notebook, and that sort of, you know, once the notebook gets big enough and maybe it takes five to 10 minutes to rerun all your analyses, that is really a big slowdown. So you don't want to have to do that. So 
Maybe another option is to instead to have multiple scripts or notebooks. So you can break it apart into these different smaller components where each one it's a little bit easier to keep track of what it's doing, which things it depends on. But not really. You're still kind of trapped in this dependency hell where you don't know, like, if I, if I make changes to this one script, I need to remember to rerun all of the things that depend on it. And it can actually be pretty dangerous in terms of reproducibility. If, if I have script A and script B and C depend on it, um, and I make um, some changes um, to script A, but then I forget to rerun script B and C, then maybe the data I pulled out of script B and C um, is now wrong because it depended on A, but I didn't rerun them. And now maybe the results in my publication are wrong. So we want to avoid that. So one way to get out of this mess is to actually have um, all of these multiple scripts and notebooks, but using um, what's called a traditional build system. So a traditional build system, um, you may have heard of under the name of something like Make, CMake, Scons, et cetera. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, if you haven't heard of a traditional build system, that's OK. The key idea behind it is that you want to run a series of commands in order, um, ensuring that the dependencies for those commands are satisfied. So let's say you have um, command one, and that produces output A. You have command two, which produces output B. And you have command three, which takes output B, A, and B, and produces output C. So if, um, you know, what this build system will do is it'll ensure that um, before command three is run, commands one and two are run so that the results A and B exist before the, the third command is actually run. So this lends itself really nicely to this type of pipeline that I showed you earlier, where we have this sort of nice directed graph. All the dependencies are explicitly st um, stated here with these, um, these arrows. And so as long as we can translate each one of these boxes into a command for the build system to run, then we can replicate this entire pipeline using such a build system. So the build system I'm going to focus on today is called SCONS. Um, and the reason why I like SCONS is because it's in Python. Um, though it's unfortunately Python 2. Um, um, but just to sort of give you an example of what of how SCONS works, what it looks like. So you, ha you create this file called an sconstruct file, and you put that in the directory where you want to run all your commands. Um, you then, it, it automatically sort of provides a few things for you. So I, I, you don't have to import environment, it's just there automatically. Um, but you, so you create this environment class, and then you have a few different things that you, you tell what are the commands you want it to do. So in this case, we're saying, all right, I want to compile this tech file into a PDF, and maybe it depends on these two figure files because there's some figures in my paper. Um, and then I have two scripts, makefig1 and makefig2.py, that actually produce these figures themselves. So when I go and then run scons on the command line, it'll read this file and determine um, what needs to be run, which is makefig1.py, makefig2.py step for the paper. Um, and uh, it'll run all of those things in the correct order. Um, and a, another cool thing about these types of build systems is that they will only actually run what's needed. So if I were to then go and make a change to makefig1.py and rerun scons, it will rerun makefig1.py and it'll rerun this paper compilation, but it won't run, rerun makefig2.py because that's already been run and the result is already there and it's already up to date. Okay, so to take a step back, uh, we were talking about running notebooks. But notebooks you typically run in your browser. Um, so how do you actually integrate these into a build system? Well, luckily for us, um, notebooks can be commands. So there's this utility called nbconvert. And nbconvert is a really versatile, awesome utility. So um, it can do more than execute notebooks. You can use it to convert notebooks to HTML, to Markdown, all sorts of different formats. Um, but the, the way that we're going to use it is just for executing. So we run Jupyter MB convert dash dash execute, and we tell it we want it to go to the output format of notebook. We, we tell it we want it to be called notebook.ipynb, and then finally the input is notebook.ipynb as well. So we're going to override the original notebook with the executed version. And so we can take this command and create a custom build rule for scons. So here we have this function build notebook, and that just takes this command I showed you. It calls it using the subprocess module. Um, and then uh, given this function, we use env.command. We tell it it's going to produce notebook.ipynb. It's going to depend on notebook.ipynb and maybe some other data files. Um, and then the command to actually run is this function we just defined. So then you would run scons. It would run your notebook for you. Everything's great. That's awesome. So that's you know, how you can do these multiple scripts and notebooks with scons. But there is also still a drawback here, which is that 
as you're working on your analyses and you're quickly iterating on things and maybe you're, you're drawing in new data sets all the time, um, maybe removing some data sets when you decide, you know, oh, this figure should have this data in it but not this other data in it, um, keeping the sconstruct file up to date can really be a pain. Um, I certainly, like, I, I had this workflow for a while where I was manually um, managing this sconstruct file and I constantly forget to update things with it. So that was sort of the idea behind NBflow was, is there a way to use this type of build system um, in a way that it will manage all the dependencies for me, in, but like, I don't have to manually maintain this sconstruct file? Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, uh, just because to, to make the, the mirror here to all the other slides, uh, there are some drawbacks, of course. The biggest one is that it's um, Python 2. Um, this doesn't mean that you can't run Python 3 notebooks. It just means that NBflow itself has to be run using Python 2, and that's because it uses SCONS, which is Python 2 only. Um, hopefully, that'll change in the future. Um, currently, also, the notebooks that you're running have to be some flavor of Python, um, but that, that's also something that will hopefully change. Um, but, okay, on to how NBflow actually works. So, to install it, you just pip install from GitHub. It's not a package yet, but it probably will be soon. Um, if you just Google for NBflow, you'll find this. It's in the README in the repository. Um, and then for your notebooks, um, what you have to do is just one thing per notebook, which is you create this cell. It has to be the first code cell in the notebook. And in this cell, you define these two special variables, depends and dest. And depends is a list of file names relative to the notebook location um, that the notebook is going to load in and depend on. And then dest is either a single file name or multiple file names, not including the notebook itself, um, that uh, the notebook is going to produce. And so if you include these things in this first code cell in the notebook, then all you have to do in your sconstruct file is import this setup function from mbflow.scons and then run setup with your environment and then the directory that contains your notebooks. Um, and then nbflow will automatically go into that directory, look at all the notebooks, look to see which ones have those special variables in the first cell, automatically construct this entire dependency tree and then run everything for you. So it works just the same as before, you just run scons, and it goes, finds all your notebooks, runs them in the right order, and everything is awesome. So um, that is kind of the basic idea behind NBflow. And the reason why I like this is because it really reduces the overhead. All you have to do is remember to update the thing that's in the first cell of your notebook, rather than going back to the separate file. It is still one thing you have to remember to do, but it's a lot easier because if you're working in the notebook, you're more likely to remember to change something that's in the notebook rather than in a separate file entirely. Okay, so um, I'm gonna now just go through sort of a quick demo of a pseudo real world um, example. Um, it's, so it's, it's you know, more than, more than just a, a very simple toy example, but it, it's, it's not quite a full um, real analysis. Um, so I'm just gonna take you, take you through um, really quickly the, the components and then I'll show them to you um, and, then, and then we'll run it. So um, we can start by saying maybe we have some data called human raw.json, so it's in JSON format. Um, maybe we also have some model um, data, and that's in a NumPy array. Um, so uh, we can first define a notebook um, called clean human data, the IPYNB, and we're going to specify that it depends on the human raw data, um, and it's going to uh, produce these results um, uh, human.csv, so another CSV file. Um, and the idea is basically that just that it's reading this in, um, doing some data cleaning, and then producing it a as a CSV format instead, so something that's a little bit easier to work with. Um, then we have another notebook which does some analysis and computes averages of this data, and that'll produce now two outputs. One is human averages.csv, so that'll be now these averages that we've computed, so not just the raw data, but the averages per stimulus, and also a figure um, showing these averages. Um, back to the model side now, um, we can have another notebook which cleans this data and produces a file called model.csv. And then finally, we have another analysis, fitmodelparameters.ipymb, which takes in both the model.csv and the human averages, fits the model parameters to the human data, um, saves the results out as a tech file and also as a figure, and then finally, we can compile our law tech document. So let me now show you how this actually works, now that you have a, a sense for the, the entire flow. Okay, so here's our data, human raw.json, model raw.mpz. 
Um, I'll just show you, for example, um, the notebook for cleaning the human data. Um, so here, you see these first two cells again. Depends on human raw.json. The destination is uh, human.csv. So I'll just run these. Um, you know, print some stuff out. That's nice. Finally, we save it to CSV. Um, we can save the file. Um, I'm not going to show you all of the other notebooks um, because I think the, the cool thing about MVflow is that it will actually take care of running everything for you so that you can see it. Um, but just to show you that they're there, um, here's uh, the cleaning the simulation. Again, it, it depends on model raw, and the destination is model.csv. Um, fitting the model parameters, human averages. Um, and now, just at the end of fitting model parameters, I want to show you um, how this the tech thing actually works. Um, so the cool thing about LaTeX is that you can define your own custom commands using a, the command new command. So you do backslash new command, you tell it the number of arguments that you want, and then you tell it what you want it to output. It's kind of just like a macro. It's not really a function. Um, and so if we have our results in Python, what we can do is just create um, these new command declarations, put inside the new command declaration the results that we want, format it as LaTeX, and um, then save these out to file. So, um, and then once we've done that, if I come over to the actual um, LaTeX paper, so I can include this tech file here, and then call these commands. So for example, model v human core is something if I go back here, I've defined as um, uh, this, correlation, um, and here is the, the actual string that I'm using to, to write that out. So it's R equals whatever the correlation is, formatted to two decimal points, 95% confidence interval, lower, upper, et cetera. Um, and you know, also, of course, including the figures and everything, too. So OK, that's the whole pipeline. Let's see it work. So just run. Oh, I didn't show you the sconstruct file. Let me do that. Sorry. Um, because there's one difference here. So um, again, this is just importing from MBflow and then running the setup function that I showed you before. Um, the cool thing about this, though, is because it's just built on top of scons, that means you still have the entire functionality of scons that you want. So if I want to, say, compile my paper too, it can do that. MBflow is not going to compile your paper for you, but scons will. So what I'm doing here is just saying, find all the results, find all the figures, um, and make um, dependencies of the paper on those things. So um, I can come to the command line and run scons. And you'll see it is cleaning the human data, um, computing the human averages, cleaning the simulation data, fitting the model parameters, and then finally recompiling the paper. Um, and if I open the paper, Hard to type with one hand. Um, you see here, um, there's uh, the figure, um, and the results are here rendered in line um, where we had those commands. And now, the, the really cool thing about this is if I go back to um, my notebook, so here, this is the fit model parameters notebook, and I refresh this, you'll see now all the cells have been executed. They all have outputs. Um, there's This is the second figure. If I scroll down, you'll see there's a the second figure, same figure. Um, so this is really nice because if you're like, oh yeah, this, this figure in my paper, what, what, what was the code that, uh, that, you know, maybe you submitted your paper for publication, you got it back six months later with revise and resubmit. All right, now I've got to remember what code exactly generated this figure because a reviewer too wanted me to, you know, do something with it. Um, now it's really easy because you have the outputs right there, same, the same things that are in the notebook. And here are um, um, the formatted new commands um, for the LaTeX as well. Um, so, you know, it's just because it's Python, you can have Python do whatever you want, and that, is, that includes writing LaTeX code. So, um, so that all works. Um, and let me just show you as well this demo of actually having it only rerun the things that need to be rerun. So if I, let's say we wanted to make the points black rather than blue. Um, I'm going to put the microphone here for a sec. Okay, so say color equals black there and here as well. I save that. I could rerun it here as well. I'm not going to, just for the sake of demonstration. Um, come back here to scons. And you'll see it's rerunning this fit model parameters script. 
and then it is recompiling the paper, but it didn't do anything else. It only did those two things because everything else is up to date and it doesn't need to waste the time doing those computations when they've already been done. Um, so let me close that and reopen it. And now if we scroll down, there is our figure um, with black points instead of blue points. Again, if I refresh this, you'll see that it's been rerun and there are the black points there as well. Um, and so that is basically how you can have these um, one button workflows in the Jupyter Notebook um, using NBflow and with very little overhead in terms of what you have to actually do to maintain it yourself. So just to wrap up, um, uh, to click through all this stuff, sorry. Um, to, oh, just as a, as a um, visual indicator of, of what it did when, it, when I re-ran it the second time, it detected that all of these things were already run and only re-ran that one and that one. Okay, so to, to wrap up, um, there's a few things that MBflow doesn't do right now. It's kind of a new thing, but um, I'm hoping to make these improvements in the future. And the first is to support non-Python kernels. And the idea I have there is rather than actually defining variables of like dest and depends in the first cell, I was thinking maybe those cells could be raw cells in the notebook and then you actually write JSON specification for what the dependencies and stuff are. So that's one idea. If other people have other ideas, I'd love to hear them. Um, the other thing is to support other build systems. So there's not anything in particular that says it has to be scones. It could be make, it could be whatever. I like scones because it's Python and it's easy to write Python code, but it doesn't necessarily need to be that. Um, uh, and this is also related to the final thing, which is I really would like this to support Python 3. <laughs> um, so, which means at least from what I can tell moving away from scones, they said that in the next release they were gonna support Python 3, but then they had the next release and they didn't support Python 3. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I, I'm not really sure what to do about that, but you know, I wanna explore some other options and see if we can get it to be Python 3. Um, and if you wanna see the example that I showed, you can go to tinyurl.com slash mbflow dash example, um, and these slides are there as well. Um, I'll take any questions, thanks. Um, there's not a way, oh, oh yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the question was, is there a way to um, visually represent the computation graph? Um, and the answer is no, but it shouldn't be too hard to do. So actually, so one thing I didn't tell you about is that um, nbflow is also a command line tool. So if I run nbflow analyses, what it'll do is it'll go into analyses. This is, this is actually like what it's doing, pulling out all of the dest and depends and, and constructing all the dependencies here. So this will just output JSON. And so you could take this JSON and use it to create um, whatever visualization you wanted. So, um, and I, there's lots of vis like graph visualization tools out there. So I think it would probably be not too hard to stick those two things together. Yeah, thanks. Ah, uh, um, so I hadn't I hadn't been thinking exactly about that. Oh, so the question was, um, can I like pip install nbflow and then use it as a library like nbflow.run to use it within other types of workflows? Like th is that good? Yeah. Um, so um, I, I I think you should definitely be able to do that in principle. Um, I, I it might take a little bit of tweaking at the moment to like get something like that to work. But yeah, I mean, I certainly think it would be great if this type of tool were like more pluggable and playable so that it could kind of fit into whatever particular workflow that you have. This, it fits into my workflow right now because my workflow was like that, but hopefully at some point it'll be able to fit into all of your workflows too, so yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. 
Um, so the question was, can you define LaTeX commands that give you a whole table rather than just a single value? And the answer is, um, oh, and the second part of the question was, have I done that? The answer, have I done that, is no, but I, I'm pretty sure that should work. Um, I, I, as far as I'm aware, maybe someone who knows LaTeX better than me can, can say otherwise, but that you should be able to define pretty much anything that you want with new command, because it really is just a macro. And what LaTeX does is it just replaces whatever is in new command with what, a, like, it, it replaces that command with whatever you've defined new command as. So I think that, I think that should work, yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, so the question was, have I looked into how difficult it is to make Scon support Python 3? Um, I, I haven't, but it seems, well, I, ha I have a little bit, but not a lot. I mean, it seems like it's probably non-trivial, um, which is probably the reason why it hasn't happened. Um, I, I think they have a lot of stuff written like in C. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm sympathetic to the fact that it hasn't happened, um, but it, yeah, I, it would be nice if it happened. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so the question was, um, have I looked into moving to make? And yes, I have, and I think it, it should be possible, but the problem with make is that really, in order to make this type of workflow work, you would need to generate a new make file every time and then run that make file because these dependencies are computed on the fly. Um, so scons is Python, so every time you run scons, it actually re-pulls out all those dependencies and recreates it. With make, you would have to first generate a new make file and then execute the make. Function. So you could do it, but it, it has an additional step. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, last question over here. Yeah, so the question is, does using this, could you have like your whole paper like in a repo and, and have that repo like just completely reproduce the paper? And yeah, you could do that. I mean, I think for, for certain projects, it might not be feasible. Like if, you know, if you're like simulation data, for like if you have your, running your simulations as part of this pipeline, for example, and your simulations take like a few days to run, then, you know, that might not be something you'd want. But like, but certainly, yeah, in principle, like you should be able to reproduce the entire thing, yeah. So, okay, thank you.